Okay, fantastic then. Let's get started then. So, what I want to talk to you today is about a novel, brand new way that we could potentially approach space access that would dramatically lower the cost beyond even what would be achievable if we were to do fully reusable rockets, like, uh, say, Elon Musk in SpaceX proposing. So, what I want to talk about is a way that if we manage to achieve this, it will change everything, enabling us to build extremely large structures in space. And ultimately, let's, let's be clear, our long-term goal is we want to send as many people as possible to live into space and eventually to move on to other stars in order to ensure that our species don't go extinct. And this is the best way that we could actually achieve that. So, how are we going to approach this problem? So firstly, I want to talk a little bit about the history behind the idea and the basic concept behind the space elevator. I'm then going to do a brief overview of the physics behind it derived from first principles, the key underlying equations that we need in order to be able to understand the concept. Then when we have the equations, we can look at some potential materials that we could use to actually build this space elevator. And combining those materials with our equations, I can then look at the full-on design for a space elevator. And finally, when we have the design parameters, we can say what we can actually do with this device. And then we can finally conclude. So let's talk a bit about the history. So this chap over here, Konstantin Tsiolkovsky, famous Russian physicist who lived about 200 kilometers away from Moscow in a random log cabin in the middle of Siberia where he spent most of his life. He's most famous for coming up with the rocket equation, which um, many people will have encountered in their first year orbital mechanics. Plenty of fun to derive that without getting the signs wrong. But what Tsiolkovsky did is that he got the chance to see the Eiffel Tower at one point during his life. And he imagined, what if we built a tower all the way up to geostationary orbit? And of course, that was a bit crazy, because a freestanding tower, if you built it that high, would do something like this. You stand it high, and then just fall straight down. Because the weight of all of the material above it, just there's no material on Earth that can just hold that up. So the concept was little more than just a dream back then. But about 50 years later, another Russian physicist came along, um, Yuri Artsutinov, who said, instead of having a freestanding tower, why don't we make use of the rotation of the Earth such that instead of having it like this, we can have it not like that. <laughs> yeah, you can see that I haven't practiced in a while. <laughs> Here we go. So the idea, take use of the rotation of the Earth, use the centrifugal force of the Earth to counteract gravity and give you an outwards force to hold the cable out under tension instead of compression. And that was the genius idea. And it was made rigorous a couple years later by the American astrophysicist Jeremy Pearson, who carried out the first mathematical analysis of how the concept would work. And since then, it's been fleshed out by various studies commissioned by NASA, for example, which have demonstrated that the physics is sound, and we could actually build this for a cost of something around 10 billion US dollars or so. So it's not so much a science fiction idea anymore. So here's the broad concept. So you have a cable that stretches all the way out, and it has to go at least beyond geostationary orbit in order to be held out under tension. You have some kind of car or cable ascending device that travels up to the top, and you have a counterweight, something like a small asteroid, for example, that goes on the top, that allows you to basically select how high you want your elevator to be above the geostationary orbit point. So let's talk about the physics. This is just a picture at the moment. So we, if we take a simple approach, let's say that we're going to have a uniform cross-section all throughout our cable, and we want to understand the physics, so we're going to need to look at the forces acting on a single element. So we're going to have an upwards force and a downwards force from the tension of all the cable above and below that point. We will have a force downwards from the weight of the element due to gravity, and an upwards force due to the centrifugal force because we're in a rotating reference frame, so it's not a fictitious force in this case. The element will have an area A, which we're going to specify, and a density, which we can also specify based on our material choice. And some other assumptions will assume that there's no tension at the bottom, so that we have a freestanding tower, and everything is going to be in equilibrium, otherwise our cable will waft about a bit and then destroy itself. So, the equilibrium condition requires that the vector sum of the four forces is going to be zero, and we can define the difference between the upwards force of tension and the downwards force of tension as being the cross-sectional area times by this dt here, which is the tensile stress, or the force per unit area, so then we can just substitute in our standard expressions for the weight due to gravity, uh, Newton's law of gravity, F equals gmm over r squared, and the standard expression for the centrifugal force, m omega squared r, where in this case m is the mass of our little element there. We can rearrange this equation to get a differential equation for how the tensile stress varies as a function of radius. 
And then um, I also note that we can simplify the expression a little bit if we introduce the definition of the radius of geostationary orbit in order to eliminate omega, which is the rotational period of the Earth, in order to get this equation. And this is the equation that we want to ultimately solve. So we want to know what will be the maximum tension that we're going to experience in our elevator. And if that is greater than any material we can build on the Earth, then the idea isn't going to work. So if you notice from our definition up here, you can see that by the definition of geostationary orbit, that's the point where the centrifugal force exactly balances gravity. So those two terms are going to disappear. And Fu minus Fd will then be equal to zero. So dt will be zero. So that is going to be either a maximum point or a minimum point at geostationary orbit. And also below geostationary orbit, because you're closer to the Earth, the weight is going to be greater than the centrifugal force. So dt is going to be positive below that point. So we're going to have a maximum point at geostationary orbit. So the idea is we're going to integrate this equation from the surface of our planet up to geostationary orbit. And that will then give us an answer for the maximum tension. And if you do that, this is the equation that we get. OK. So ultimately, we're going to want to sub in numbers into this to see how large it is, see whether it's good or whether it's a problem. But there's one other thing we can do quickly, which is we can work out the height of our cable using the, we get it for free effectively from the same differential equation. Because we have a boundary condition that we can apply. If we actually integrate from the radius of geostationary orbit outwards to the total height of our elevator, which is also going to have the tension being zero because of the freestanding tower assumption, we can then apply on the other side, by definition from the radius of geostationary orbit to the total height of our elevator right at the top. And this will give us a second equation for the maximum tension, which then by equating with the previous one, we can eliminate everything and just get a cubic equation for our height. But we hate cubic equations because they're nasty to solve. But luckily, the radius of the planet just happens to be a solution, so we can factor it out, get a quadratic equation, and by solving a quadratic equation, we can finally get the total height of our space elevator. Excellent, but we don't like nasty equations like that. Let's sub in numbers and find out what it actually all means. So by subbing in the standard things, and notice RP here is the radius of our planet, because this is all general for any planet you want to use. On an exoplanet, for example, if you're crazy enough. But if we use it for the Earth, we find that our total height would be about 150,000 kilometers. And the maximum tension, the tensile stress, sorry, we're going to experience is 382 gigapascals. The problem is that if you were to build an elevator out of steel, it breaks if you have anything more than two gigapascals. So this isn't going to work. So the idea is we're going to have to either relax our assumptions and change something, but because this design isn't just going to work. So a different idea is the way we're doing it at the moment is we have zero tension at the bottom, zero at the top, and then a huge spike in tension at geostationary orbit. Why don't we instead spread the tension uniformly throughout the entire cable and instead let the cross-sectional area vary? Because that should hopefully reduce how much tension we're going to experience. So instead we just modify it slightly, we fix the tension as one of our parameters, um, and instead we use the variable, the cross-sectional area. And again, we have the exact same differential, sorry, we have the exact same vector sum of forces, but this time our definition of the tensile stress changes because T is fixed and A is varying. And stepping through the similar steps, we get a differential equation for the, how the cross-sectional area varies this time, which we can then integrate up. And I've just simplified some things by introducing the gravitational acceleration at the planet to make it slightly less messy. But this is our equation for how the cross-sectional area varies. And notice that it's an exponential dependence, which is going to be a problem because we all know how exponentials grow and blow up. And we don't want our elevator to be wider than the Earth or something because we don't have enough material to actually build that. But there's some other free things we can get out of this as well. As again, we can work out the height of our elevator by noting that the cross-sectional area at the top will be the same as the cross-sectional area at the planet as a boundary condition, which tells us that the argument of our exponential will be zero. And that incidentally gives us the exact same cubic equation. So the height of our elevator is the same in this case, 150,000 kilometers. And one thing I'm going to note for just future reference, I'm going to define something called the taper ratio, because the problem is Nothing determines what this cross-sectional area is at the planet. I can specify whatever I want. So what we're interested in is the ratio between them. Basically, you start off with an elevator this wide. How much wider is it going to be by the time we get out to geostationary orbit? And this is the taper ratio. Now, just before I sub in numbers and check whether this design is going to work, I haven't mentioned the counterweight property to this point, which is that little asteroid that we shoved at the top. Because this gives us the advantage that we don't have to build an elevator that is the full 150,000 kilometers out. We can make it slightly shorter than that by shoving a weight of, say, 50 tons or so at the top. 
So here we have an equation just balancing forces. We have a force of gravity acting down, which is this term. We also have a force of tension from the cable pulling down, and that's balanced by the centrifugal force going outwards. And then by stepping through and subbing in the cross-sectional area from this equation here, we get an absolutely horrible equation for the mass. Because you're pushing to the limits of what you can actually do analytically by this point. Oh, that equation's really messy. Eh? And one other thing you can also do is if you take the cross-section area here, multiply by the density, and integrate all the way up to the top of your elevator, you can also work out the total mass, but you need to get a computer to do that numerically because there are no analytical solutions. Okay, don't worry, derivations and stuff are over now. Now we're going to actually look at what this all means and what we can use it for. So, let's look at some potential materials. Steel, here's our density, here's the maximum tension, and note I've included about a factor of four safety or so for steel, because we don't want, say, a random gust of wind to hit our elevator and then cause it to snap. And we get a taper ratio that will call the elevator to look a bit like this. <laughs> that's that's going to be a bit of a problem to try and climb that. So steel isn't particularly a good idea. I mean, you could step up to something slightly more sensible, say Kevlar, for example, and that knocks you down many orders of magnitude, but 10 to the power 8 still isn't going to work. So then we have to then go to the lab and consult some friendly condensed matter physicists to see if they can offer some kind of super material for us. And this might just actually be a thing. So who, who here has heard of carbon nanotubes? Raise your hands. Ooh, very interesting, because they are just a wood material, stronger than diamond, because they luckily do, what's it, sp2 hybridization instead of sp3 hybridization, making their bonds extremely strong. So if we sum in our density and the maximum tension, and notice how huge this is, it's not large enough to build the first design of the elevator we looked at, but if you sum it into our previous one, we get a taper ratio of just 1.6. So the cross-section area hardly varies at all when we use this super material. So this is really something that we could build this elevator out of. So what I've done now is picked and choose some values to finalize our design. So I've said arbitrarily, I want my elevator to be 100,000 kilometers high because that's a really nice number. So that then fixes the mass of the counterweight as around 50 tons, which is quite feasible to, well, we know NASA's trying to redirect an asteroid, so I'll just go ask them to get me a 50-ton asteroid for me. Um, I've selected a density very similar to carbon nanotubes, and again, I've included about a factor of two safety in the maximum tension. That may increases our taper ratio slightly to about four, and this is the cross-sectional area that I chose, and this was based on a separate calculation in order to work out how much mass you could transfer up the cable on each car, and I set that at a couple tons or so. And when you integrate that all the way up, actually, the entire elevator only weighs 100 tons. Which is quite remarkable, bear in mind, we're building a building that goes all the way up to way past geostationary orbit. So that, that, I find that quite incredible. Now the question is, what can we do with this device? Because we've tricked some politicians into giving us $10 billion to build it, so we better be able to do some cool stuff with it. So, let's take a look. Let's climb our elevator, and then zoom out into the solar system so we can get a bigger picture on what's happening. So the idea is that once you get out to the top of your space elevator, you're travelling at a much faster velocity than you are just on the surface of the Earth. So if you let go at the right moment, it can send you onto an elliptical transfer orbit out into the solar system for free. You don't need to expend any fuel. So this is the case that we have. And the idea is, I want to work out how far out into the solar system we can use the system to reach. For example, can I get to Mars for free? That would be a very nice thing for me to know. So, quick crash course in the orbital mechanics of this, conservation of angular momentum. We're going to equate m times velocity times r at our launch point, where in this case we get a boost of vl, which is our launch velocity, which is just equal to the angular velocity of the Earth times by the height of our space elevator, plus the velocity of the Earth around the Sun, and then you equate that with the angular momentum at aphelion, the furthest distance. You can do exactly the same for conservation of energy. You have your kinetic energy term versus plus your gravitational potential energy term, and you can then just solve these equations. You can eliminate VA in term from the first equation, sub it into the second one, and then ultimately you get a quadratic equation for the maximum distance from the sun, which you can then solve, and this is the equation you get. But this is boring, this is an equation, we want numbers. Sub in numbers, find out what it means. Sub in the equation for the, the sorry, the numbers for the velocity of the Earth around the sun, the distance from the sun that the Earth is at, the mass of the sun, and the rotational velocity of the Earth, and what we find is that we can actually reach out to Jupiter's orbit just by letting go of our space elevator for free. And once you're at Jupiter, you can use gravity assist to access other planets and other moons, which is great. 
And actually, if you let go when you're at the other end here, when your velocity is opposing the velocity of the Earth, you can access the inner solar system. And in fact, you can actually go as close as 0.43 astronomical units, which is just a little bit shy of Mercury by doing this approach. So I can get to Mars, so I'm perfectly happy, but I would also like people to be able to get to Europa because there might be life on there, so it'd be a very interesting thing to investigate. So, conclusion. All you need to give me and my crazy team of mad scientists is a 50-ton asteroid, 100 tons of carbon nanotubes, and, I don't know, give me about 8 billion pounds or so and should be able to do it. And in exchange, we can open up our solar system and eventually the universe to human exploration. And I think the best way that summarises this feeling is, was said by Carl Sagan. A still more glorious dawn awaits, not a sunrise, but a galaxy rise. A morning filled with 400 billion suns, the rising of the Milky Way. Thank you. Incredible. I love it. So any uh, questions for Ryan? Yes. Charlie. Yep. Yeah. Oh, that, that's why you have to have tension in the cable in order to keep things there. And it's, it's quite possible as well that, um, because there's a lot of things I've neglected, the biggest problem is actually the moon. Because the moon obviously exerts tidal forces, which can actually cause waves and oscillations in your cable. So you have to have small devices on the counterweight and actually on the cable in order to stabilise it. Actually on the ocean platform at the bottom, which I didn't mention actually, of your cable. So it's much more complex than this. You would require engineering in order to stabilise it and keep it in position, yes. Ah, well, expenses aren't the problem. The problem is building something that long. Um, we've not yet got to the point in technology where we can manufacture that many carbon nanotubes. However, from a pure cost perspective, they're dirt cheap. It's just literally like a soot-like carbon. Um, I say NASA's estimates into if you could build it, how much it would cost, was around 10 billion US dollars over a 15-year period. But we're nowhere near the point yet where we can make that many carbon nanotubes. Um, my conservative estimate would be about 2090 for building one of these things. So we'll have to push on, I believe, because we've got to get through five folks. So, uh, <laughs> yes, uh, thanks everyone for listening and give a round of applause to Ryan again. Thanks.